Hello, and welcome to the month of Spooky 2023. Scary stories are a part of life. We've been telling them since the dawn of man over campfires, radio broadcasts, television, and these days, social media. They remind us of our own mortality, get our adrenaline going, and send chills through our bodies that, well, we just can't explain. During this month, you can expect the unexpected, hear the unbelievable, and witness stories that will stretch your imagination. Why? Because that is what we do here at Ron's Amazing Stories. So settle in for the spooky and be prepared to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by Cap... Ron, do you know the elements of a story? Sure. Plot, settings, characters, point of view, and conflict. Good. Listener Trey Oswaldo from New York sent this in. Will you read it? Okay. Why not? My 14-year-old daughter was told to write a short story for English class. The rule was that it had to be under 50 words, have all the elements of a story, and have a Halloween feel. She struggled a bit, but here's what she turned in. My dad was tucking me into bed and I asked him, Daddy, please check for monsters under my bed. He smiled, looked underneath for his amusement, and saw a copy of his daughter under the bed, staring back, quivering, and whispering, Daddy, there's somebody on top of my bed. My daughter got an A. Well, it does cover all the elements of a story. It does, and it is quite clever. Do you think you could come up with a 50-word scary story? Yeah, I think I could. Okay, do it. Hmm, well, let me see. Okay, here we go. My parents told me never to go into the basement, but I wanted to see what was making this odd noise. It sounded like a puppy, and I wanted to see the puppy, so I opened the basement door and tiptoed down a bit. I didn't see a puppy. And then my mom yanked me out and yelled at me. She had never yelled at me like that before, and it made me sad, and I cried. Then she told me never to go down into the basement again, and she gave me a cookie. That made me feel better, so I didn't ask her why the boy in the basement was making noises like a puppy, or why he had no hands or feet. Ron, that was a lot more than 50 words. In fact, it was 123. Okay, so I failed then. But you had to admit, it was a pretty good story. Well, don't expect a Pulitzer. I have no expectations. Good. However, we should thank Trey and his daughter. You're right. Thank you both. (laughs) Hello, and welcome to the scariest podcast this side of Transylvania. The show today features more of your stories 
including a special edition version of These Are Your Stories. Isaac Osborne from Firestone, Colorado, tells us all about the Flames of Ghosts. We have another amazing story from Arch Obler and his series, Lights Out. This time, it's a traditional ghost hunt with chills and thrills. Our audiobook review comes from the book, Real Ghost Stories, Halloween Hauntings. So, with so many things to do, it's probably the best to just get things going. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks, and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So what am I listening to? Real Ghost Stories Halloween Hauntings by Eve S. Evans and Roger Harrell. It is said that Halloween is the night where spirits roam and feel free to be amongst the living. The only thing is you have no idea where they'll be. Will they choose your house, your work, or the other side of your bed? Who can say? Here's a sample from the book of what you can expect. This story is titled The Skeleton on the Wall. I pulled the covers over to my chin, too scared to do much else. The scraping seemed to get near the door, then it was like it started to move up the wall. The noise seemed to get louder as it got higher and higher. It filled the room. I was hoping my mom and dad would hear it and come and save me from whatever this was. But I didn't think anyone was coming somehow. I knew I was the only one hearing the noise in my room. The dragging, scraping sound seemed to move above my door. Then it stopped. Somehow, the silence was worse than when the noise was there. At least then I knew where it was. This way could be anywhere. I could feel the air get heavier in the room, and the shadows near the door seemed to swirl together and take shape. First it took the shape of a human skull. Then it was like every vertebrae formed one by one out of the shadows. Next came the ribs, the pelvis bones, then the arms. It began to crawl around the wall above my door, its eyes never leaving my own. The fact that it didn't have any legs only added to the grotesque figure on the wall. It clawed at the wall, dragging itself along, which explained the noise it made. It seemed to shift and began moving up towards the ceiling. Could this thing really get up there? I hope not. My hopes were quickly dashed when it seemed to suspend upside down in the air and began to crawl towards me. If I could have screamed or ran, I would have, but I was so afraid I was pinned to my bed. It got closer and closer until it was nearly right above me. It began to reach one of its hands out, trying to grasp and claw at my face. I pushed myself as far away on my bed as I could, but it only advanced further along the ceiling. Finally, it got right above me, and it turned its head completely backwards and stared right at me. Suddenly, it let go of the ceiling and began to fall right towards me. I knew I wasn't going to be able to move fast enough. I gritted my teeth and squeezed my eyes shut as tightly as I could. I waited for the bone claws to sink into me, but nothing happened. I waited a full twenty seconds before I was willing to open my eyes. I looked everywhere, but I couldn't see anything. The room was silent, no scraping, 
no dragging. I didn't know what had happened. The skeleton was right there. I had seen it fall right towards me. I spun around, sure it was on the wall behind me, but the wall was empty. I was so tired from the fear, and all I could do was lay back down on my side. Silent sobs racked my entire body as I tried to process what I had just experienced. But how can a girl of only eight years old come to grips with that kind of nightmare? Despite how tired I was, sleep still eluded me. The next morning, I didn't even bother trying to tell my mom or dad what I had seen the night before. They wouldn't believe me, and I don't blame them. Had it not happened to me, I wouldn't believe it either. Real Ghost Stories is a collection of 20 tales that should make you shiver just a bit. It takes you from grandma's haunted house to a roommate who just isn't there. You'll hear about moving tree limbs and wailing women. Each tale reminds you that you may not be alone. Stephen Lowell narrates this one, and he does a fantastic job. He uses just the right amount of voice acting to make you feel what you hear. And what you will hear are some of the creepiest real-life paranormal encounters that have happened around Halloween. Now, if that appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories and you can have Real Ghost Stories Halloween Hauntings for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This also grants you access to the included catalog, which is updated constantly with new titles. So, to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. These are your stories, special edition. Welcome to These Are Your Stories. You might be asking, how is this different from the other segment? The answer is simple. These are special. But what makes them that way? Again, the answer is simple. They deserve special treatment. It may be the content of the story or how the story was obtained. Or it could be that the storyteller himself or herself is actually here in person. No matter the how, why, or where, what you'll hear in this segment is going to be special. This one has elements that I've never heard before, and I've been doing this for some time. The story was sent in by Isaac Osborne from Firestone, Colorado. He has titled it, The Flames of Ghosts. My family comes from a religion that acknowledges ghosts. Theravada Buddhism believes that all individuals become a ghost once past. Stories I've heard as a child still haunt me to this day. I always try to brush them off as a way to scare naughty kids and to get them in line. I refuse to believe ghosts are real, but more often than not, I'm reminded that denial isn't always the solution. Recently, I've been hanging with my brother and younger cousins. Now that we're older and in college, we do this more often. One night, the topic of ghosts came up. One story after another. Everyone in the room shared and had the same expressions on their faces. Scared, confused, denial, and expressions of trying to forget. The scary thing was is that everyone had paranormal experiences in the house that I grew up in and still live in while I attend school. This made it more surreal as I tried to disown my own experiences. And there were many. I was in my early teens when I got my first job. After a closing shift, my dad picked me up and I got home late into the evening. I live in my family's basement, furnished well with a bathroom near the common room and my bedroom down the hall. 
Like always, I was ready to hop in the shower and get to bed. After the bathroom, I decided to dump my clothes into the basket in the laundry room. While changing, I hear the smoke alarm go off. I ran towards the detector outside the bathroom to see the fake plant on top of my toilet engulfed in flames. Okay, within the plant is where I like to hide my contraband and lighter that I would use for... recreation? For the record, I don't do that anymore. And besides, it's legal now. I simply couldn't believe that the lighter lit the plant and started the fire all by itself. But it did. And it was on fire. My parents, who had run down, began to scold me about playing with fire. I dumped the flames into the toilet and thereby exposed my stash. Obviously, no one believed me that I had nothing to do with it, and talk of rehab surfaced. It wasn't until I told my brothers and cousins this story did I stop to think that it might have been a ghost trying to stop the usage of illegal materials. The next week after the ghost chat, something happened that shook my core. I love to listen to music, and I have set up an elaborate lighting system to watch while I fall asleep. I woke up to a tall, dark figure standing in the corner of my room. At first, I thought it was just my imagination, but it was covering the lights, so I knew it was an object. I was left in complete shock, and I tried to flee. My body froze, and I couldn't breathe properly. Out of nowhere, I felt two hands grab me, so I just started kicking and screaming, Get off me! Then, silence. I pulled the blankets over my head and called my brother on my phone. I told him to come get me. We went to a late night coffee shop downtown, and I shared with him what had happened. It might have been just sleep paralysis, but it felt so real. While at the coffee shop, my brother told me this story. He was about eight. At the time, we shared a room on the second floor of the house. He had gotten up and headed down to the kitchen for a drink of water. While there, he saw a creature enter the room. It didn't have a face, and it was as black as night. It walked through the wall into the backyard. My brother said he ran out there and saw an explosion of white light, and it was gone. He tried to tell our dad about it, but he just told him to keep it to himself. My siblings and mom have had encounters in the house similar to mine. There were many stories that I could tell, and all of them are just as crazy. Things disappearing, sounds that no one can track down, more fires, strange lights, and even a ghost cat. Which is another story that will send chills down your spine. I graduate this June, and I already know that I'll be moving to Boulder to start my internship at a law office. The funny thing is, I think I just might miss this old house. Isaac Osborne, Firestone, Colorado. Well, that was amazing. I would love to hear some of those other tales you spoke of, especially the one about the cat. I asked Isaac to send me the address of the home so that I might do some research. I didn't find anything that would explain the events. I did find that Elite Barbershop, which is about a half a mile from your house, has a story of a former barber, Shorty, who is said to roam the shop after hours. A photograph of Shorty hangs on the barbershop wall near the front door, paying homage to the spirit. Not much, I know, but that's all I found. Thank you for sharing, Isaac. Our featured story continues with Arch Obler's Lights Out and what might be the creepiest tale so far. A family rents a ghostly old Victorian mansion from Service Supreme for two months. The cost? Only $100. Cheap, 
even in the 1930s. But what will be the real cost? And what does Obler's sense of horror have in store for us? Recording is rough, but the story is amazing. You might want to use headphones on this one. It is titled simply Organ, and it first aired on May 12, 1937. Perfectly correct. One hundred dollars rental for two months. And now, uh, it's a matter of a receipt, of course. Yes, you don't mind. Not at all. Not at all, Mr. Cook. Do business in a business-like way is my motto. We aren't a very large firm, but service supreme is our motto. Uh, what did I do with my receipt book? So careless of me. In this pocket was... Oh, oh, any old piece of paper will do. No, 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 no. Here we are. I had it in this pocket all the time. I'll just sit down over there and write it out. Well, darling? Well, that is simply unbelievable. Fifty bucks a month for a furnished Grand Central Palace like this one. <laughs> Beautiful. There's something wrong in the wood pile someplace. Would you really think so? Ah. Uh -huh. Now, I'm only really kidding. Well, this old house seems to kill me somehow. It's so full of shadows. Oh, nonsense. You're letting the storm outside affect you. You were always afraid of lightning, you know. There was a blinding flash just as we came in the drive. It illuminated the whole house. It seemed to glower at us, almost forbidding us to enter. There you go, letting your imagination work overtime. At 50 bucks a month, we're getting a marvelous bargain. I, uh, I only hope Service Supreme over there gets the receipt made out uh, before he changes his mind. He, uh, he's silly. Sleeping. Over there on the sofa. <laughs> yeah, he made himself right at home pretty quick, didn't he? <laughs> the fact is, Papa, what? Now, that's libel. I never curled up on a strange sofa. Huh? Hey, without at least three drinks and a proper introduction. <laughs> Anybody oh, else? Oh, quiet. Here comes service to pee. Yeah. yeah. Here we are, folks. Money received, rise and proper. <clears throat> I, I, uh, I hope you'll be quite satisfied here. Uh, quite. Oh, I'm sure you will be. As you can see, our little boy has made himself at home already. Uh, cute little fellow. I do hope he'll be quite all right. <clears throat> well, I, I must be getting along. Business, you know. Uh, moving in at once, aren't you? Well, we planned to... Yes, 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 yes. You, you told me you were. Well, uh, good luck and uh, uh, goodbye, Mrs. Crook. Uh, Mrs. Crook, goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Well, <laughs> I wasn't in a hurry to get out. Service supreme until the minute the rent paid, and then it's exit extraordinary. <laughs> well, I better go get the things in out of the car. Gosh, dear, I never thought we'd spend the summer in a mid-Victorian mansion, did you? Huh? Dear, I'm talking to you. Hmm? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Why the pencil look? What are you thinking about? A foot that man here. Footman. Oh, you mean service supreme, huh? Mm. Well, what pearl of wisdom did he spout? Well, remember when you looked at Gilly sleeping there? Yeah. He said, I do hope he'll be all right. Yeah, so he did. So what? Oh, the way he said it. Ah, <laughs> uh, go on. Say, hey, uh, you'll have to get some help in to clean up this place. Looks like my fraternity house used to have to be through a dance. 
Fuck. Huh? What are you staring at? Huh? What are you doing in here? Hey. Oh, boy. Bella, you started it. <sighs> what are you doing in here? Chuck, he must be the caretaker of the real estate man. Hold us about it. Hey, sure. You answer me. What are you doing here? Look here, old boy. You don't have to throw any tests. It's, we rented this place from Service Supreme. I mean, uh, what's his name, Mr. Hawkins? That real estate man up in town. Rented? Yeah, sure. Here's a receipt. A hundred bucks for the next two months. Two months? Yeah, yeah, I know it isn't much, but it's all the fellow wanted, and so that's all he got. Of course, with all due respect to you, caretaker, uh, you are the caretaker, aren't you? Yes. I. Huh? Oh, good. Then I can speak freely. Uh, as I was saying, the rental doesn't seem like much, but after all, big as it is, it's a pretty crummy old place. Yeah, well, it is. That real estate fellow said there hadn't been anyone living here regularly for 20 years since these people, uh, what's the name? All died. Renal. Huh? What'd you say? What did he say, Anne? No, no, but he frightened me. Reynolds, Mr. and Mrs. and Paula. Oh, Reynolds, yeah, they're the people that lived here, aren't they? Mr. Who's this real estate said something about... Get off of here. Huh? Get off of here. Fuck. You're a hell man. Now, get wait off. a minute, sir. Oh. Wait a minute. Get off. Get off. Get off. Get off. Now, now, we run no, this place. No, no one to... belongs here. No one. And then that's mine. Stop waving your hands around. Twenty oh, years. Stop mine. it. Get, get out. Get out. Say, what yeah. is this? You all get out. All of you. Popped a valve or something the way he was blowing off. Hey, give me a hand. We'll put him up in the other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here you are. Come on. Take the hands off. Hey. What? Take your hands off me. Oh, now look yeah. here. We just want to help you. Yeah. Your hands. Your hands off me. Chuck, help him get out. No. Here, let me get the door. Here, you. Yeah. No. Oh. I am all right. I, I will live longer than anybody. Hey, you, you will have to get out. You, you will have to get out. No one must stay here. Hey, no one. Get out. Hey, get out. Now, wait a minute. Can you imagine that old duck? Running off like that. <laughs> boy, oh boy, did we get a bargain. A house and entertainment by a crack nut off for 50 a month. Oh, but why would he so cruel? Don't ask me. I'm no psychiatrist. Oh, well, let's not let old crack pot spoil things. I'll slip him a few bucks in the morning and he'll be all right. Now, uh, let's wake that snoozing son of ours. Look, huh? he's here to wait. Why? <laughs> you little rascal, you. How long have you been sitting there watching, young man, huh? A long time. Where are we, Dad? Ah, tell you, Billy Boy. We're in a great, big, beautiful house where you and I and Father are going to have a good time for the next two months. <laughs> Isn't that good news? Well, why don't you answer your mother, Billy? Aren't you glad we're going to be staying here in the country? Dad... Yes, huh? Please let's get out of here. I'm awful scared. Yeah. 
Well? <laughs> like a regular chair. Oh, but just keep you Oh, that air of ours is sleeping so sound it takes Susan's band to wake him up. Maybe we should have let him sleep with us this one night. And have him grow up into a lily that falls over at the sight of his own shadow? <laughs> I know, Mrs. Cook. He sleeps in that room and likes it. Anyway, he's deep in sleep, so that's that. Uh, uh. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. That did not feel good. Uh. It's going to take at least two bands to wake me up tonight. Hmm. You lock all the doors? Mm-hmm. And the windows? Are you sure? No, no, listen, honey. Please tell me. I am telling you. This house is locked up tighter than a hooskow. Southern doors, everything. I tell you, if that crazy old coot decides to come back to continue his oration, you'll have to use a hacksaw to get in. I wish it was morning. Hmm? Hmm? You could sort of straighten things out with him. After all, he is the caretaker. No, forget it. We rented the place from the regular agents, and if the old boy doesn't like it, well, it's just too bad. Now what? Uh, let's go to sleep, huh? The cat. Oh, Anne. But I want to know. What? Well, why should he have gotten so excited? He's been worrying. Oh. I don't know. Maybe because he thinks we will mean more work. Twenty years alone. Huh? What'd you say? Oh. I was just wondering why this place hasn't been rented or sold on these years. Mm. I don't know. What could it be? What? Oh, nothing. Hey, are you thinking of... Oh, that's nonsense. Mm -hmm. Why, sure, just because the house is big and old and hasn't been lived in for a long time doesn't mean that... Oh, I tell you that storybook stuff. Huh? Why did you ever say that he was frightened? Oh, he's just a little kid. Well, isn't it possible that young children are closer? To what? To... Things that aren't of this world. Huh? And cold. But I was just thinking. We're not thinking things like that. Of all the screwy ideas to get in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. Now, come on. Go to sleep before you give me the jitters, too. Save the ghost talk for tomorrow morning when the sun's shining. It's a little dark and dismal. Weird right now to be talking about. Does when the organ plays in church. 
Yeah. Oh, no, honey. Just a few more hours. Yes, kids are wonderful. What? Billy. Look at him there. Asleep as if nothing had happened. Hmm. He doesn't know anything big. No, lucky kid. Ah, you just wait until that old son starts doing his stuff. And I'm going to turn this house upside down until I find out what's been bothering me. Hmm? Did you hear something? I don't know. I thought I heard something inside. That horrible music is here. It's here. An organ right in this room. No, no, it's happened. Where's it coming from? Oh, I don't know. A room. 
Yes, I see it, too. Oh, look what's happening, sister. Maddie, what are you afraid of? Anne, there's someone sitting in that room. In the green light. Yes. It's a... It's a girl. She is so clear. And yet, somehow it isn't real. Is it? Look at the way she's dressed. So strange. So queer. And yet it's more like a picture on the wall. Not deep. The flatness of the picture. Look. Look. There's a man coming into that horrible light. My right, George. It's him. What? Don't you recognize him? The old caretaker. Yes. Yeah. But now he isn't so old. Get me out of here. No, 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 no wait. You don't dare go. Not yet. Pictures on the wall. And yet not pictures. He's going closer to her. Yeah. I see it. God in heaven, he's talking. He hasn't flesh. I know he hasn't. Oh, you, Mr. Albert. She speaks, too. Pictures talking, is it? Am I not? Yeah, Paula. I wanted to talk to you. But you know, Mr. Elvis, Mother doesn't like to have me talk with you. Because I'm a simple man, eh? A gardener. A servant. Oh, Chuck, don't talk. Whatever the reason, Mr. Elvis, you shouldn't come here when Mother's away. It isn't right. You're a mother. Mr. Elvis. Yeah, you're a mother. I've got nothing. So I'm not good enough, eh? Please go. Your father. He promised me, before he died, he promised me in his will. He gave me money. Plenty money for all I did for him. Well, I'm sorry he didn't leave it to you. Ah, uh, you mother, you Don't blame her. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't in the will. But how could she give it to you? Your father, he promised me. Mr. Reynolds, he promised me. They're the people that own this house. The Mr. Hooker said they've all been in debt for 20 years. No use, Mr. Olsen, talking about that again and again. Please go. Oh, you drive me out too, eh? Oh, please don't talk like that. <laughs> if I had money, the money your father promised me, you wouldn't tell me to go, would you? Maybe you would love me, huh? Marry me, eh? Don't look at me like that. Don't frighten me. <laughs> That you could love me anyway, Paula Reynolds. I make you love me. No. Uh, make no. you love me. Leave me alone. 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 Leave me Coming back. Oh, look, Billy boy. Here, darling. Put your head against mother. And look. He's killed her. Oh, Chuck. Standing over her. That horrible look on his face. Chuck. Another woman's coming in. The mother. He's turning toward her. He's going to kill her. I can't move. I don't want to scream. I can't. Do something, Chuck. He's killing her mother. Killing her. What can I do? I'm rooted here. I can't move. The light goes. And they go with it. But we saw him kill them both. Mother and daughter. 
Billy. Billy didn't see. No. No, he buried his head against me so tightly. Where's Chuck? What's the matter? Billy's asleep. Asleep? Yes. So quietly against me. Well, if there is someone out there, didn't want him to see that horror. Only one time. Well, if there is someone out there, didn't want him to see it. Whatever it was, I'm getting out of here. Quick. Give me the boy. Wait. <laughs> what is it? The old man. The one we just saw. The one you just saw what? You. You killed him. How and why, I don't quite understand. We saw you kill the mother and daughter. Oh. You know. Was it real? What did we see? Yes. I killed them both. Oh. Yes, I killed them. And why not? The one gave me no love. The old one. No money. He promised me. He promised me. But when he died, he gave me nothing. Yeah, killed him. Yes, yes, killed him. With my own hands, I killed him. Stop the police. Yes. <laughs> There were no police in. There will be no police. But Murph, two women. They know. I know. And now, you know. No one else will ever. What? What do you mean? You're here. Hey, Bunda. Yeah. I guess I'm... Now, you know why I didn't want you here. Now, you know why I must kill you. you? That gun. Yes, with the gun. Him. Twenty years ago with my hand. Well, you're crazy. You're a gun. No, 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 And then it seemed to turn in my hand toward him as if, as if someone... I saw. Billy, is, is he... Oh, so sleepy. Sleepy? So all that... <laughs> Bless it to me. And there was play. And the women. Two women sitting at the keyboard. No, no, Chuck, don't play any closer. Oh, no. Chuck, what is it? No. No, I was wrong here. Yeah. Wrong? Not women. Not anymore. Two skeletons. Oh. In dresses. Oh, no. <laughs> I understand everything now. He killed them 20 years ago. And then walled up their bodies in there with the organ. But what we saw, the news, how could it? And look. It calmly moves into dust. Lights Out, written especially for radio by Arch Overlord, comes to you each Wednesday from our Chicago studio. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
that was an incredibly good storyline. I hope that the recording didn't put you off too much. I had to do some audio repair and the filter took out some of the ambiance. I think what made this story so effective for me was the acting and the idea of having a child as a focal point. They say that children can see the supernatural. I guess they thought that as far back as the 1930s, which surprised me some. Lights Out was definitely ahead of its time. No wonder Arch Obler was considered an innovator of the radio drama. I hope you enjoyed this one. These are your stories sent by you for you. Our story for this week comes from Joe Garza from Scottsburg, Oregon. We've had a lot of stories on this show, but this one by far grabs the title Unique. It is the perfect story to tell in the month of Spooky, and also happens to be from my backyard. Well, that is if my backyard was 198 miles long, that is. Here is George's story. My story is true. I know that when people hear it, they'll think I made the whole thing up. That used to bother me, but these days I live with it. It does not stop me from telling it every chance I get. Someday it's my hope that someone will believe me. I want to thank Ron for this opportunity to share to the biggest audience yet. It happened in 1993 when I was 10 years old. My father and I went camping. The original plan for the summer was to have the whole family there. My little sister had other ideas and was born an entire month early. I was heartbroken that we would have to cancel the trip, but then my mom decided that we should go. The baby was healthy and Dad could use the break. Also, I heard later that the reservation was not refundable. So, it was that we too would go for the whole family. We were going to Cascadia State Park, which is located on the site of one of Western Oregon's early mountain retreats. Cascadia is a little-known state park gem in the Cascade foothills, 14 miles east of Sweet Home. The Giesendorfer Hotel, with tennis courts, croquet, and bowling, has long since disappeared, but the feel of the century-old leisure lifestyle of visitors coming to drink the natural mineral waters lingers. The place is alive with history, from the ancient rock art in Cascadia Cave to the very ruts of the old Santiam Wagon Road. It was while visiting this old trail our story happened. To this day, my dad will not talk about the event that occurred that day, but at least he does not deny what happened. We are at the point on the trail called Tombstone Pass. It's the beginning of a treacherous seven-mile hill for westbound travelers. It got its name from a family tragedy in 1871. While stopping overnight to camp with his family, 18-year-old James McKnight was accidentally shot as he retrieved his gun from between two bedrolls. His grieving mother placed a tombstone in his honor. That gravestone is still there today. It was getting late in the evening when my dad and I decided that we'd unpack our dinner that we'd hiked with us. My dad built us a small fire, which to this day I'm not sure he was supposed to do, but he did, and we heated up franks and beans, a real westerner's dinner to be sure. We were laughing and having a good time around the fire. We were thinking about mom and the new baby sister. When suddenly a man came up to the camp. 
Well, boy would be a description, but to me he looked like a man. I estimated he was around 18 years old. He asked if we had any extra grub and that he would chop or do whatever he had to to earn his keep. My dad, being the cool guy, joked with him for a minute about chopping down one of the nearby trees, and the boy just smiled. My dad told him to have a seat and pointed at the food. It was then I noticed for the first time that I could see through the boy. I wondered why my dad hadn't said anything. He looked strange, like he was there, but not all there. He was dressed like he was some sort of reenactment character from the 1800s. My suspicions were confirmed about his non-solid nature when the boy walked into the fire and passed through the other side without disturbing it or being burned. Both my dad and I looked at each other in dismay and disbelief. Then the boy tried to say something, but after a few more seconds, he simply faded out and was gone. We were never scared. We never felt in danger. After the event, all we could do was make sure we both had seen what we had seen. We, of course, told Mom about it when we got home. She was quite polite, but she never did believe us. My sister, who is in her 20s now, believes the story, and I think my wife believes me, but I can't be sure. Was it the ghost of James McKnight? Can't be sure of that either. But we were only about a half a mile from his final resting place. George Garza from Scottsburg, Oregon. What a great story, George. I did a bit of research and found the name James McKnight in the census records of the Parma Township, Cuyahoga County, Ohio. That's where he was born. The family left there to come west, so the story is actually history. The timing is a bit off and had him listed at 20 at the time of his death and not 18. The Santiam Wagon Trail holds an interesting and unique place in Oregon's history. Unlike other wagon roads that were built to bring settlers to the Willamette Valley, this road was designed to lead settlers and their livestock eastward to the rich pasture lands of central Oregon and Idaho. How about that? I want to thank you for your story, George. I can honestly say I've never heard one like this before. And I believe you. Holy smoke. That was episode number 614. George Garza and Isaac Osborne provided the stories today. And I have to say, I appreciated and thoroughly enjoyed them. Thank you both. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. Ron's Amazing Stories